Uh, welcome. This is the Penn Humanities Forum. I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the forum. Um, I'm delighted to see you all here. This is the fifth event in our series on adaptations this year. Our presentation today is co-sponsored by the psychology department. I want to uh, extend my thanks to them for their generosity. Um, this is the fourth consecutive event in what has worked out to be kind of like a, a mini-series within our annual series, uh, a mini-series on the legacies of Darwin and the interplay between the humanities and the sciences of species adaptation. After today, we, we take a, um, a break for a couple of weeks through Thanksgiving, and our next event will be on Wednesday the 30th. And at that point, we'll shift gears and approach adaptation somewhat differently with uh, David Harvey speaking about, um, uh, well, about the, um, uh, the, the, the madness, um, the alarming mutations of uh, speculative finance and the... Uh, <laughs> uh, the evolution, perhaps maybe the extinction of capitalism as we know it. Uh, so um, that will be a nice event. It will be in the Harrison Auditorium, the other auditorium, not, not here. Um, as usual, uh, I need to remind myself to turn off my phone, and I'll uh, use the occasion to remind you as well. We will take a break after the um, presentation. Um, Robert Seaforth is going to uh, do the presentation today. His uh, partner and collaborator, Dorothy Cheney, will be um, uh, taking the lead in the Q&A, which will be after our short break. So that's the way we're going to sort of work out the division of labor. Um, but let me start by telling a, uh, a story uh, that I like. You, you probably know that Vladimir Nabokov, the author of Lolita, was also a self-taught lepidopterologist, a butterfly scientist. Um, in fact, the, the physical descriptions of his famous nymphette, Lolita, Dolores Hayes, um, her apricot midriff showing between the uh, white of the tennis whites um, or the bathing suit, um, the, uh, the fine copper hairs of pubescence um, on her uh, tan arms and, 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 and pale back, um, her little claws, these are actually encoded descriptions of the first butterfly that Nabokov discovered in America, um, which he, he discovered near Dolores, Colorado, hence her name Dolores. Um, Nabokov believed his work on butterflies, which involved arduous research and, and resulted in, uh, I think, a dozen um, uh, papers in the scientific um, journals. He believed that his work would, like his novel, stand the test of time. But in fact, he had little impact on the field, um, has not been much cited in the scientific literature. He developed uh, kind of a highly eccentric taxonomy of the blues, uh, the, the blue butterflies, uh, which had them originating in Asia and then migrating to the New World via Chile and up to North America. And by the 70s, all this work had been um, pretty much dismissed as completely wrong. Stephen Jay Gould expressed uh, strong regrets um, about uh, this kind of, uh, of behavior, what he saw as Nabokov's amateur dabbling in science. Uh, the brilliant, innovative novelist, said Gould, developed no original uh, or innovative um, theories regarding butterflies. Nabokov's scientific research was an example of what Gould called intellectual promiscuity resulting in wasted genius. Uh, a great poet and novelist like Nabokov shouldn't be um, uh, spending his precious summers away from Cornell, tromping around in Colorado, chasing butterflies and, uh, and, and developing crackpot lepidopterological theories. Uh, and, and by the same token, the, uh, the brilliant scientist shouldn't be wasting her time trying to write like the great American novel. That's sort of how he, uh, how he presented it. But some months ago, a paper appeared in the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society of London co-authored by some of the, the, the world's leading uh, lepidopterologists, leading authorities on butterfly speciation. And this paper details a decade of new work using the latest gene sequencing technologies. The upshot, I don't understand all the work, but the upshot is that Nabokov's eccentric and wrong-headed theory actually now looks to be exactly right. Um, <laughs> the 21st century DNA sequencing vindicates the species distinctions that Nabokov alone was making 60 years ago. 
um, and supports pretty much fully the theory of um, Asian origins for all the blues. By God, said Professor Naomi Pierce of Harvard's biology department, it's really quite a marvel. He got everything right. All right, so what's the moral of this story? Um, it's not actually one that Stephen Jay Gould would dispute. He may have had it wrong in this particular case, but Gould was himself uh, an, an ardent critic of the notion that art and science could be held apart in perfectly separate domains. Uh, he argued for the unity of creativity, I'm quoting him here, the unity of creativity and the falsity of our traditional separation, usually in mutual recrimination of art from science. Uh, or as Nabokov himself put it, no science without fancy, no art without facts. Uh, Warren Breckman, uh, who is our topic director this year, made this, this very point um, in his introductory remarks two weeks ago, apropos of the poetic and imaginative dimensions of Charles Darwin's work. We in the humanities do well to remind ourselves from time to time that scientific inquiry involves art, language, philosophy. It is not the alien other of our own practices. And by the same token, scientists do well to appreciate the rigor and the conceptual force of humanistic inquiry. That, anyway, is the official position of the Penn Humanities Forum, since Warren and I have both stated it, uh, and, and, we're, uh, and, and we're in charge this year. Um, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the official version. And um, I, can, uh, I, I, I couldn't ask for, for more suitable or more distinguished scientists uh, to help us convey this perspective than Penn's own Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seyfarth. Uh, Professor Cheney, a biologist, and Professor Seyfarth, a psychologist, have worked collaboratively for more than 30 years on the social behavior of non-human primates, writing dozens and dozens of influential articles and advancing, the no advancing knowledge at the forefront of their fields, while also writing uh, books that are accessible to a general reader and have been compared to good detective fiction or Edith Wharton novels of manners. The title of their 2007 book, Baboon Metaphysics, Riffs on a telling remark of Darwin's, one who understands baboon, uh, said Darwin, could contribute more to metaphysics, to the philosophy of knowledge and being, than John Locke. Uh, if this sounds a little flattering to the uh, field scientist and a little disparaging to poor John Locke and his fellow speculative philosophers, uh, that, I think, is not the aim of Professors Cheney and Seyfarth. To be sure, their work has demonstrated that in, our clo uh, in, in order to understand the evolution of the human mind, we do need to study the minds of our closest animal relatives. But as they write, while the scientific study of mind is an exciting prospect, a large dose of humility is also in order. Life presents us with great and complex riddles, and Professors Cheney and Seyfarth approach these not just with the best tools of their respective scientific fields, but with philosophical acuity, artistic inventiveness, alertness to social nuance, and a keen sense of narrative. It's a great pleasure to have them here at the Humanities Forum. Uh, please join me in warmly welcoming Robert Seyfarth and Dorothy Cheney. And Robert will come <laughs> first to him. Thank you all for coming. Um, the theme of this year's Humanities Forum is adaptation. And we've chosen as our topic the adaptation and evolution of the mind, particularly the adaptation and evolution of the mind of our closest animal relatives, the non-human primates. When you embark on a topic like this, inevitably you go back to Darwin. About 20 years before Darwin published The Origin of Species, he began to realize that his theory of evolution by natural selection originally designed to explain the evolution of morphological structures like the beak of the finch, could also be applied to cognition, to thinking, to the way that animals and humans organize their mind. And he wrote in one of his notebooks, we can thus trace causation of thought. It obeys the same laws as other parts of structure. And a few pages later, he penned the quote that has already been given, the origin of man is now proved, metaphysics must flourish, he who understands baboon would do more toward metaphysics than Locke. And what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about of what we've learned in the past 30 or 40 years about the metaphysics, the thinking of baboons and chimpanzees and other non-human primates. 
And, um, but to do that, first, I'd like to talk about, um, I'd like to give you a, a little anecdote. About the same time that Darwin was writing in his M notebook about these things, the English explorer, Sir James Alexander, was coming back from a trip to what is now Namibia and describing what he'd seen. And one of the things that he described seeing was members of the Namaqua tribe using baboons to herd their goats. The baboons, he said, would go out in the morning with a herd of goats, watch after the goats during the day, give alarm calls if they saw a predator, and then herd the goats back into the corral at the end of the night, often riding on the back of the largest goat. This seemed like an apocryphal story, and no one really believed it until in 1961 when the German uh, naturalist, Walter Hoesch, went to what is now Namibia and described a few farmers who still use baboons to herd their goats. And again, the description was much the same. The baboon would ride out on the back of a goat, watch over the goats during the day, give alarm calls and so on. And the most famous of these baboons was a baboon called Allah, who you can see here grooming one of the goats and looking after it here. The thing about Allah that was amazing is not only did she look after the goats, but she knew all the goats as individuals. If one was missing from the herd on that day, she got very upset and went looking for it. She also knew the relationships between the kids and the mothers. In the evening, when Allah led the goats back in, often the farmer separated the mothers from the kids because the mothers would then be milked. This worked out most of the time, but on some occasions, a kid would get very upset and would start bleeding. And Allah, at that point, would become very agitated, would go to the kid barn, grab the kid, and take it to the other barn and give it to its mother. Allah was so intent on putting the kids with the mothers that she acted, actually acted against the farmer's interest. Occasionally, a goat would give birth to twins. And at this point, being a good husbandry, uh, husbander, the, the farmer would try and foster off one of the twins to another mother who had lost her kid. Allah would have none of this. She took the twin and put it back to its proper mother. So the question is, where does a mind like this come from? Here's an animal that was separated from its own species, thrown into a barn and raised with a bunch of goats, and yet on its own, without any reward, it recognized all the animals as individuals, recognized who went with whom, and made sure that the animals that were together were the ones that should be together. And what we'd like to argue is that Allah's mind and the mind of baboons and chimps are the product of evolution by natural selection. Just as the quality and characteristics of the seeds have shaped the evolution of a finch's beak, so the problems that monkeys and apes face in their social lives, problems that have to do with others of their species, they have shaped the evolution of the primate mind, including our own. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about comes from a study that Dorothy and I have been conducting for quite a few years in the Okavango Delta of Botswana, Here's Botswana in southern Africa, and the Okavango Delta is a vast savanna, and as many of you may know, each year rainfall from Angola comes down and floods much of the Okavango Delta, sort of like the Everglades, up to about knee depth. And when the baboons move around, they have to move from little islands of dry land through the water, and they do this in various eccentric ways, sometimes by walking, sometimes by running, sometimes by riding on the backs or skipping. You can actually see our baboons doing this in Planet Earth, the BBC series, if you look at the thing on savannas. Um, we follow the baboons around, wading through the water along with them, um, and then gradually the water evaporates and recedes, and at that point the baboons are walking mainly on dry land. And again, we follow them. We know all the individuals in a group of about 80 animals, and we follow them through their daily lives and take data on their social behavior and their social interactions. And just to remind you, I'm going to be talking a lot about baboons and chimpanzees and comparing them with humans. So just let me give you a reminder of the evolutionary relationships. Um, here is a rough-hewn tree of the primates. About 40 to 50 million years ago, the New World monkeys split off. Baboons are Old World monkeys. They live in Africa, and they had a common ancestor with humans about 25 million years ago. 
Chimpanzees, on the other hand, are much more closely related to us. And there was a common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees about six million years ago before their ancestors divided. Um, baboons have a wonderfully intricate social structure, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. When a young male baboon is born, he grows up, and as he gradually gets larger and larger and becomes fully adult size, he will eventually leave the group where he was born and go to join another group. And he will spend his life sort of battling his way to the top of the male hierarchy in one group or two groups or even many more. Females, on the other hand, remain in the group where they were born throughout their lives, and they maintain close social bonds with their female relatives, their mother, their sisters, their mother's sisters, and so on. And females also assume dominance ranks similar to those of their mothers. So what you have in a group of baboons, the core of the group, is a bunch of adult females arranged in a linear rank hierarchy where at the top is the highest ranking female in the highest ranking family, and then come her daughters, and then come the next ranking female in the next ranking family, all the way down to the lowest ranking animal in the lowest ranking family. So the group is a hierarchy of matrilines, and there's an intricate interaction between competition and cooperation. The baboons cooperate with each other in many cases, and yet, nonetheless, they also compete. And yet, the competition is not terribly serious, at least when it comes to reproduction. We say there's low reproductive skew among females. What we mean by this is that it's not like a pack of wolves where only one male and one female breed. All the females in the group breed. So there is competition, but it's not enough to suppress the reproduction of low-ranking females. But the interesting thing about this is that the relationships among these females are highly differentiated. Some pairs of females are really closely bonded, especially mothers, daughters, and sisters, and so on. But occasionally, individuals form strong, long-lasting bonds with other individuals. And those other individuals are unrelated to them. So there are really strong, enduring social bonds. And we now know from working on this group for 16 years that these close bonds can last for many, many years without any disruption. I should say one other thing about the ranks is that the ranks them also, the ranks of families, are very stable over time. And so we've seen over 16-year period um, a turnover of individuals in some families, but the family occupies the same rank. Occasionally, there are very rare challenges to the rank hierarchy. And this is interesting because if there's a challenge between family D and family C, and family D wins the challenge, all of the members of family D rise in rank over all the members of family C. So the families move when they do, in rare cases, up or down the hierarchy as a unit. So there are these differentiated relationships. Some are very close, some are not so close. And again, the long-term data from this study is beginning to show us that these close relationships makes a make a difference. It turns out that if you're a female who is closely bonded to other females in the group, your infants survive better. And here are some of the data. And what we've done in this particular case is divide the females into three groups, those with the strongest bonds with other females, intermediate, and the weakest bonds with other females. And here's a survivorship curve where we start at birth with all of those females' infants, and we trace the proportion of infants that are still alive after five years, 10 years, and 15 years. And what you can see is that if a female is weakly bonded with other females, her infant's survivorship is much worse than if she's strongly bonded. Somehow, the strong bonds between females translate into successful infant survivorship. Now, you might just say, well, it's the females who are still alive that make a difference. But it's not that, actually. This is data from only social bonds with mothers and daughters where the mother and the daughter were alive for the whole period of time. And in this case, the surviving offspring are still the ones with the strongest bonds. So it's not just whether your mother is present or not, or your sister, or your aunt. It's how strong your bond is with that individual. 
And the strength of social bonds also influences longevity. Here's a survivorship curve for the females themselves. And again, the females are in red with the strongest social bonds and in green with the weakest social bonds. And females with strong social bonds live for a longer period of time. So what seems to be the case is that natural selection has favored those individuals who are skilled enough to form really consistent and enduring social bonds with other individuals in the group. And it's the mechanisms that allow these animals to form these kinds of bonds that, that I want to talk a bit about. But I should say first that baboons are not unique in this respect. It's increasingly becoming clear from, um, from uh, studies of other species that long enduring social bonds are quite common throughout the animal kingdom in, in hyraxes, in different kinds of monkeys, in hyenas and horses and mice. There are still, in all of those species, cases in which you can identify pairs of individuals that form a really close social bond and for whom that social bond helps increase their reproductive success. So what are the mechanisms that underlie these close social bonds? How does it work? How do the animals do it? First, I want to talk a little bit about the cognitive mechanisms, about what animals need to know and what they do seem to know about the other animals that make up their group. Um, I, I mentioned that, um, that individuals seem to recognize each other, and, and it's not only that primates, that baboons in this case, look different, have different facial expressions and, and facial features, but they also sound different. Their vocalizations are individually distinctive. And here, what I'm going to play you is, here are six of the females in our group. And for each female, I've played two grunts. The grunts that they give are the most common vocalizations that baboons use, and they use them all the time. So you'll hear two from Camilla, two from Helen, and so on. And just to give you an idea of how they sound and how different they are. So, so the baboons' voices are different, and so they present you with individually different characteristics, and it turns out that in monkeys as a group, there are specializations in the brain that help recognize the faces and voices of other individuals. In humans, there's the well-known fusiform face area that helps us recognize the faces of others and is and un prevents us from doing so if there's a lesion in it. Well, there's a similar area that's been recently discovered in monkeys. Similarly, there is in humans an area in the brain specialized for recognizing the, the vocalizations of a particular individual and also a similar area in monkeys. And finally, there is also evidence that um, in humans, we have special areas in the brain that are associated with cross-modal recognition of individuals by which I mean the following. Imagine you're sitting in your office and you hear a familiar speaker outside in the corridor. Immediately, you know exactly what you're going to see when you go out there. You've taken a sound, an auditory stimulus, and somehow in your mind transformed it into a visual stimulus. And you'll be surprised if you see a different individual out there. It's sort of cross-modal recognition. And, and it turns out that monkeys and baboons have the same sort of thing. That in fact, when a monkey hears a vocalization from its own species, there's activity not only in the auditory area of its brain, but in the visual area. And that's something that's sort of interesting and unique, and it enriches the, the individual recognition. If you go into the field, there are a lot of experiments that we've done that show that individuals are able to recognize the relationships that exist among others. So let's imagine that in a group of baboons, we'll use letters to denote the families and numbers to denote the individuals within each family. Well, you can do an experiment that shows us that female B1 recognizes the close bond that exists between D1 and D2, the members of the D family. You can show that by an experiment in which very often um, a female is sitting there, she hears the scream of a juvenile, and she looks at the juvenile's mother as if to say, ah, I know that juvenile. He goes with you. What are you going to do about it? So they recognize the relationships that exist among others, and they also recognize the ranks 
that exist among others. So female rank three recognizes that five outranks six. And we know that from experiments in which, in one case, we play an animal, a sequence of vocalizations that makes it sound like five is fighting six and six is screaming. And there's not much response to that. But if you shift the tape around and play them a sequence that makes it sound like six is fighting five and five is screaming, that gets a rapid reaction because that violates what the individual thinks exists in the group at the time. And finally, baboons in another experiment show that they can combine information on kinship and rank and create in their minds a kind of hierarchy. And the way we do that is you play an animal, an animal a rank reversal that suggests that four is fighting with three and three is screaming. Well, that's fine, that's a rank reversal, but it's all within the bee family, and it really only affects those two individuals. But if you take the same thing and play three is fighting with two and two is screaming, that gets a much stronger response because it suggests that there's a major upheaval afoot that B family is about to rise in rank above, a family, above the A family. So the animals simultaneously recognize not only the identity of an individual in the group, but also their kin membership and their rank relations. So what is all this knowledge good for? How does it play out in the daily lives of baboons? I'm going to give you one example from a behavior that has been anthropomorphically and quite accurately described as reconciliation. Um, baboons, like other group living animals, face a problem. They benefit from living in a group, protection against predators, better to find food, and so on, but they also incur costs because they have to compete with others for scarce, scarce resources. Baboons and other primates have a way of mollifying the di disruptive effect of aggression within the group by reconciling. A threatens B, and B is nervously moving away, but then A goes over and touches B, or hugs B, or grooms with B, and B relaxes. So the aggression has occurred, but there's not been as much disruption as there might have been. Baboons... So reconciliation mollifies aggression and seems to report, restore opponents to baseline tolerance levels, and baboons rec reconcile by grunting. A threatens B, and as B is about to run away, A gives a grunt, and you can see B relax. This happens pretty rarely, only about 10% of the fights, but we know that it actually works because we've done the following experiment. You walk around following the animals, and you wait until A1 fights with D1. And then you do one of two things. Either you play B1's grunt, B1 being another animal in the group who was around but not involved, or you play A1's grunt. And you see how this affects D1's behavior. And it turns out that this makes a major difference. It makes D1 approach her former rival or tolerate the rival's approach if she approaches D1. This call doesn't make any difference. So the grunts really do work to reconcile. And it gets even more complicated because in about 20% of the occasions, what happens is one animal threatens another and then a relative of the original aggressor comes by and, as it were, reconciles on behalf of her sister or mother. Well, we wondered whether this really works to reconcile. So we did another experiment, waiting until A1 fights with D1, and then we would play A2's grunt, another member of the A family, but not the original antagonist. And here's the control where we played B1's grunt again. And it turns out that playing A2's grunt causes D1 to approach A1 and A2, or to tolerate theirs, those, their, their approaches if they approach her. But B1 has no change in behavior. So consider what D1 has to be thinking about this whole sequence of events in order for this kind of behavior to work. D1 has got to be thinking whenever he hears a vocalization, who's calling? Is she looking at me? Is the call an aggressive or a friendly call? If we've recently interacted, she's probably calling to me. Wait a minute, is the caller the relative of someone I recently interacted with? We can't explain the results of our experiments without assuming that the animals are going through some sort of thought process like this. 
And so what this means is that for a baboon, individual recognition is more than just individual recognition. An individual who hears a vocalization recognizes that call as coming from that particular individual who's a member of that family, who occupies that rank, who may have been interacting with certain other individuals in the immediate past. So an individual's identity is inseparable from her place in society. And lest I try to bring the humanities and the sciences together again, this is very much like what goes on in Edith Wharton novels. Um, that individuals are recognized, of course, as distinct individuals, but they're also placed in society. And their place in society creates expectations on the part of the author. And this sort of thing, this description of behavior among the characters in Edith Wharton novel is the sort of thing that you could imagine a baboon equivalent going on. So those are the kind of cognitive mechanisms that seem to have been favored by natural selection and led to these close social bonds among baboons. But they're not the only mechanisms, and I want to talk a little bit now about hormonal mechanisms and start by discussing a little bit about baboons' response to stressful events in their environment and the way in which, under stress, they take steps to alleviate it. Um, and I'm going to focus particularly on predation. In our study population, predation accounts for about 95% of all of the deaths of juvenile and adult animals. It's mainly predation by lions and leopards. And baboons find this behavior extremely stressful, as you can imagine. We, we now know this because within the past 10 years, there have been some wonderful technological developments that allow us to measure stress levels in individual animals in the wild without capturing them and taking a blood sample. And it involves collecting a fecal sample from individuals. And so what we've done for about a five or six year period is every week from every adult in our group collected a fecal sample. And so here's Dorothy collecting a fecal sample from this female. We do it once a week because it gives us a sort of average level of glucocorticoids, a hormone that's associated with stress, over the past 24 to 48 hours. And then we process this in our highly technical lab in the field and, and do some other analysis back here. But it gives us a chance to measure stress. And sure enough, it shows us that if we look at fecal glucocorticoid levels here, in months where there's predation, the levels are much higher than in months when there isn't. And stress levels as a result of predation are particularly elevated if a female loses a close partner to the predator. So here, for example, is changes in glucocorticoid levels. Right along there is the zero line. And we've compared the data for 22 females who lost a close relative to the lion or leopard and 22 control females of the same age and dominance rank. And you can see that the ones who lost a relative had much greater elevation in their cortisol levels. Now, this is a major disruption in the social relationships that we've been saying are so important to baboons' survival and reproduction. How do they react to it? Well, um, in some cases, well, and in some cases, not. This is Sylvia, the oldest female in our group. And here she's being groomed by her daughter, Sierra. Um, a few months after this, Sierra was taken by lions. And Sylvia was really bereft. She sat by herself. She was isolated. She had trouble keeping up with the group. She gradually just seemed to get weaker and weaker. She seemed not to be motivated. She didn't respond well to this. But in fact, most of the females showed exactly the opposite reaction. The females who lost a close relative to, pre to predators, who lost their best grooming partner, for example, increased the amount of grooming they did to others in the weeks and months that follows. So here's the data for 14 females who lost a close relative. They increased their grooming rate. Control females didn't show much change. So what's interesting here is that the stress, that the stress response seems to be adaptive in two respects. In the short run, it may help you escape from the lion. But in the longer run, it motivates you to engage in those behaviors that lead to the kinds of social relationships that in turn reduce stress. So it's a self-correcting process, this stress response. 
And that's an interesting finding in baboons because it so closely parallels some work that's recently been done in long-term studies of humans. For example, in this book, The Status Syndrome, there's wonderful evidence that a close network of social allies helps people Buffer, them, help buffer people against the vagaries of modern life and reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. And this book that's been recently getting a lot of reviews um, comes out with the conclusion that the best predictor of who lives longest in American society is those that somehow, some way, have close social bonds, a close network of relations with other individuals. But stress is not the only factor that binds individuals together. And I also want to talk about a couple of other hormones that play a major role in, are known to play a major role in social interaction. And to do that, I'm going to talk about work that's only recently, or it's not actually come out in chimpanzees, but it's work that, that uh, some of the people who are just publishing it have, have encouraged us to, to talk about today. And this involves telling you a bit about chimpanzee society, which is very different from the society of baboons. Um, chimpanzees live in forested areas of Africa, and they live in large communities that contain many males, many females, and they're young. Within the community, the membership is stable, but at any one time, the animals can break up and reform into groups that may be single animals, two or three foraging together, six or seven foraging together. It's really quite unpredictable. It's called, for that reason, a fission fusion society. So the community is constant, but who you would actually find foraging, foraging with any other animal on a given day is quite unpredictable. There are very, and, and the other thing about chimpanzees is that males stay in the community where they were born, whereas females tend to leave the community where they were born. So consequently, it's the opposite of baboons. It's the males that tend to be close social, close relatives. And it's among the males that you most often find really strong, enduring social bonds, sometimes lasting 10, 12 years. Most of the, many of the males who form these bonds are close relatives, but some are not. It's just about equally common between related and unrelated individuals. And these enduring social relations among male chimpanzees are manifest in grooming. They groom together a lot. They form alliances. Here, three males are chasing away a fourth from a resource. The males hunt together, usually hunt mon hunting monkeys that they then eat. And also, males go on patrols defending their community against other neighboring communities. And the hunts and patrols are really quite dramatic events. On hunts, males seem to hunt cooperatively. They usually hunt monkeys. And they cooperate to capture the monkey. And then at the end, there may or may not be food sharing of the meat. So here's a male eating a monkey and another hoping to get some. Here's a male begging for food. And this male is going to hand the food to him. And so the, the hunts are quite dramatic and sometimes have food sharing and sometimes don't. The patrols are even more so because in this case, the males band together, sometimes as many as 40 males, and they form a large group and leave their community's territory, walking for hours, patrolling the border. They're highly vigilant, like this male down here, and they're completely silent, which is very unusual for chimpanzees. Usually there's a lot of screaming. If they come upon an animal that's a member of another community, they will join together in a mob attack and kill the animal. So the territorial patrols are really quite dramatic events and potentially lethal. Um, and we know about levels of stress hormones and testosterone in these animals because of field workers who are following around the individuals and collecting urine. Um, so here's Marissa Sobolewski, whose work I'm going to be talking about a bit. And here's one of her assistants carrying a little triangular thing with a plastic bag that you go under the chimp, and you here's the chimp urinating, and you just position yourself. And, and the urine provides you with, with uh, information about hormone levels averaged over the past one to three hours. And so they collect the urine whenever they possibly can, opportunistically, and then save it and analyze it later. 
Now, I mentioned one um, neuropeptide hormone, oxytocin, that you read about in the paper all the time. It's very much involved with social bonding among group living mammals, including humans. And it turns out that it's also involved in bonding among chimps. So if you look at levels of oxytocin among chimps after they've been grooming, there are baseline levels. There's after grooming with an individual with whom you don't have a close bond. But if you've been grooming with a relative, or if you've been grooming with an unrelated animal with whom you have a close bond, oxytocin levels are much higher. So oxytocin seems to be involved in binding these individuals together and underlying these social relationships. Um, it's also the case that food sharing is associated with higher levels of oxytocin. I mentioned that sometimes there's sharing of food and sometimes there isn't, but here's work from another site in Uganda, um, Roman Wittig and Kathy Crockford, and there are levels of oxytocin at events where there was no food sharing, and here are the events where there was food sharing. So oxytocin, again, seems to be involved when cooperative behavior is manifest. And conversely, testosterone that's associated with aggression is lower in cases where there are food sharing and than it is when cases after there's been a hunt but there's been no food sharing. So food sharing seems to be associated with, um, with interactions like, f food sharing seems to be associated with, with a higher level of hormones that are associated with bonding between individuals and a lower level of hormones that are associated with aggression. Um, now the interesting thing about these bonds among male chimpanzees, like the bonds among baboons, is that the interactions that make them up, grooming, forming alliances, sharing food, going on hunts, going on patrols, these interactions may be widely separated in time. Um, two males may groom on a Tuesday, then share food on a Thursday, then go hunting on Saturday, and then form an alliance again on Sunday. And so this separation in time means that um, the animals are dealing in different currencies, and it means that very likely they are remembering past events that the ability of two individuals to form a close social bond depends on each animal's memory of its previous interactions with other individuals. And this, in turn, means that if we want to look at the mechanisms that bind individuals together and cause these close social relationships, the strong bonds depend not just on cognition and not just on memory and not just on hormones, but also on an interaction among all three of these factors, that they're all working together, and natural selection is, on the other hand, favoring those individuals who are able to form these close social bonds. Um, but of course, chimpanzees and baboons are not humans, and we are very different. So at this point, it seems fair to ask, what are the differences? What are the most important things that make us human? And I want to focus on a couple in particular, but, but one that is known in the trade as having a theory of mind, having the ability to represent the thoughts and beliefs and mental states of another individual. Humans routinely take into account each other's mental states. Harry says something to Sam, and he knows that Sam will not only hear what he says, but he will think about what he says, that it will become part of Sam's knowledge. Sam, on the other hand, hears what Harry says, and he thinks that what Harry says is a truthful representation of what Harry thinks. We do that routinely. Um, this kind of uh, empathy allows us to predict and manipulate each other's behavior. Um, it allows us to be introspective about our own mental states. It, present, it allows planning. It allows mental time travel, thinking what it was like in the past, imagining what it would be like in the future. And a full-blown theory of mind is essential for human language and culture. That's sort of a widely agreed fact. Now, we aren't born with a theory of mind, but it develops gradually in children. And, and the best way to describe this is to give you, is to describe a, a classic experiment that was done many years ago. Um, Imagine that you're sitting with a child who's about 16 months old or so, and you're looking at a little puppet show. And you're looking at the puppet Maxie. And Maxie has got a piece of candy. And Maxie has to go to the bathroom. So she's going to hide her piece of candy so that no one will take it while she's away. 
So Maxie hides the candy under the red sofa. She leaves the stage. And then you say to the child, we're going to play a trick on Maxie. We're going to move the candy. And you take it from under the red sofa and put it in the green cupboard. And then you say to the child, when Maxie comes back, where will she look for the candy? And the child of 16 months will say, in the green cupboard. The child at that age can't imagine that another individual has a mental state or knowledge and certainly can't imagine that another individual has a mental state or knowledge that is different from her own. As she gets older, she'll begin to recognize this. And she'll say, she'll look under the red sofa. And she'll be wrong. At that point, the child passes the false belief test. So children have to develop a theory of mind. And it becomes an intimate part of our lives. And it just doesn't seem to be all that present in apes. Here's an example. These are chimps in West Africa that do perhaps one of the most complicated things that chimps do. They have a very, very hard kind of nut that can only be broken open by smashing a stone against an anvil. So they find where the anvils are in the forest, they go and collect hammer stones, they go and collect armfuls of nuts, and they sit, the adults do, like this one, smashing these nuts all day, and they get a great amount of protein from doing this. The youngsters are climbing all over the adults. They're watching them do this. They occasionally try and grab the smash nut and eat it themselves. But at no point do the adults ever teach the youngsters. The adults just go about their business cracking nuts. They don't take the youngster's hand, put the hammer stone in it, and guide them to doing it. They just hammer the nuts away. And the youngsters are left to learn by observation, which turns out to be a relatively slow process. They don't do it themselves until they're seven or eight years old. It's as if the adults can't seem to realize that this infant doesn't have the knowledge that I have and then take steps to redress that. So there's no real teaching. And this is just one of many examples that suggest that non-human primates are really different from humans in their lack of a theory of mind. But the situation is somewhat more complicated than that because I've been talking about a theory of mind as if it's a unitary factor. Either you've got one or you don't. But it turns out that work on kids suggests that a theory of mind comes gradually in development. That if you take a 16-month-old child and you say, does your sister like broccoli? She'll say, oh, no, she hates it. Does your sister know that we're going to have broccoli for dinner? The child is bewildered at that point. So at that age, she's able to attribute a motive, a like or a dislike, to her sister. But she can't attribute knowledge. She can't say what her sister knows, but she can certainly say what her sister likes and what she doesn't like. And in this sense, she's got a little bit of a theory of mind, but certainly not the whole thing. And there's some evidence that the development of knowledge about another animal's motives comes before the development of, of knowledge about what another animal knows. So it may be that we're underestimating primates, and possibly they have the ability to attribute intent or motivation to act to other individuals without recognizing knowledge. So for example, here's a vervet monkey, a low-ranking male vervet monkey named Rosebury. And right now, he is trying to get this female, by pushing her, to go around behind this bush, and then he will mate with her. But while he tries to do that, he's furtively looking over his shoulder to the alpha male, Campbell Bannerman, wondering whether that alpha male knows what he's going to do. Now the question is, does he know that if he's out of sight and Campbell Bannerman can't see him, Campbell Bannerman won't know what he's doing? Probably not. But he probably does attribute some sort of motive to the alpha male, a motive to break up this little tryst that he's got at this particular time. So that's one area in which people are doing work on theory of mind that suggests that the, the, the dividing line between humans and non-human primates is not as clear as we thought. But the other, um, equally interesting, has to do with planning. I mentioned that introspection about our own mental states permits planning and mental time traveling. And this has always been a kind of puzzle for people who look at animals. Darwin was a classic example. Darwin said, 
At one point, it's freely admitted that no animal is self-conscious and he doesn't speculate on his past or his future or what his life and death are going to be like and so on. But how can we feel sure that an old dog with an excellent memory and some power of imagination never reflects on his past pleasures or pains in the chase? And if he did, this would be a form of self-consciousness and time travel. And it might, into the future, be a sort of planning. So the question then becomes, can animals ever plan or envision alternative scenarios? And, of course, we don't know the answer to this question. It's, it's, and it's very difficult to figure out how we would get an answer to the question. But here's some interesting new data on chimpanzees that, that causes us to, to think about it again. Um, you'll remember that when chimpanzees go on hunts and when they go on patrols, these are highly stressful events. So stress is elevated, and in the case of patrols, testosterone is also elevated, as you might expect, because it's a very aggressive sort of event. But the interesting thing about this is that the hormones are elevated before the animals even embark on their quest. So if you look at the data, baseline data, this is the data on cortisol, a stress hormone, before the chimpanzees went on a hunt and before they went on patrol. And by this, I mean at least two hours before they actually had set off to embark on this. In the case of testosterone, it's not elevated before a hunt, but as we might expect, it's elevated before a patrol. So in other words, before they've actually embarked on this event, all of the chimpanzees are experiencing a different hormonal state. And it's not too far to imagine that they could be aware of this in some sense, and they could perceive the change in behavior in others, and the possibility that this might lead to a rudimentary form of planning. It's early days now, and of course we don't know the answer, but it's another case in which the dividing line that we drew between humans and other animals is perhaps a little bit blurred. So the question is then, when did all this get started in human evolution? Here's a sort of progression of our evolution, and the question is, what selective forces jump-started it all? When did our ancestors become curious about other individuals' thoughts and not just their behavior? Because that seems to be a crucial change in the course of our evolution. Um, I have no answer to this, and we really don't know how it's going to turn out. So all we can do is restate the question. And to do so, we've chosen again the example from Edith Wharton. Now this, what I showed you earlier, is an example that deals entirely with behavior. It simply says what individuals do with each other. And given the proverbial typewriter, you could easily imagine that a baboon or a chimp could produce this sort of prose. But if you make only a slight change in the account and you make it with the attribution of knowledge, the attribution of motives, the attribution of thoughts, then it's something that is uniquely human and something that would be largely incomprehensible to a baboon or a chimpanzee but makes perfect sense to us. And of course, it does represent not the age of innocence but the end of innocence. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, about 25 years ago, uh, students of animal behavior were talking about sociophysiology as um, a feedback loop that permitted uh, uh, animals in, the, in, a, in an attachment bond to regulate each other's physiology. And um, I'm wondering then if, if that is the case, do we have to infer cognition? And if we do, which would be primary? I mean, obviously, that's a, it's a very difficult question because these things all come part of a parcel, you know. And I, I like to think of the hormonal data as being a way in which you can interview animals, in a sense. You can ask them, what are you feeling? Because it's, it gives you a kind of independent and, um, measure of how they're responding to events. And so we, it's almost like interviewing them. But on the other hand, the hormonal response isn't conscious. And so you can interview an animal and ask it, what are you feeling um, as a result of this predation event? 
uh, by looking at its behavior and by looking at its hormones. But you can never really, one of the things that we can't do is, is, is analyze that behavior in terms of, say, a theory of mind. We can say, for example, that by its hormones, the animal appears to be, be feeling grief. But we can't say that it's reflecting upon life and death. And, and this is a big problem. Um, our we can tell through behavior and by uh, hormonal responses what it's doing and what it's feeling. But the problem is with something like the theory of mind is that it's a very slippery concept, as you know. And you can explain almost any behavior in terms of a theory of mind, and you can also explain almost any behavior with the lack of a theory of mind. And, and so it's, it's finding that balance that's really difficult. Um, I think that Robert and I and many people working with this would now agree that animals appear to have, some, there are a lot of experiments suggesting they appear to have some access to the intentions of, of knowledge about the intentions of others and even some access to their own judgments. But to the extent, to what extent that's explicit um, is, is another question that is just, you know, something we have to ask. There's a lot of work that's being done in captivity in this regard, and we deliberately day, today wanted to focus on wild animals in the context in which this behavior has presumably evolved, but there's just a huge corpus of data on captive animals as well. Do you ever observe anything that's similar to autism in uh, chimpanzees? You know, and that's gabbies? a really, really good question because presumably aut autism would be some um, – and people with autism, as many people here already know, have very great difficulty passing the false belief task that Robert was describing and to att attributing mental states to others and even simple things like following gaze direction and pointing. Um, and so any evidence of autism in a primate would presumably pr provide a kind of perverse <laughs> Um, demonstration of a theory of mind. And the, the short answer is no. People ask us all the time, have you ever seen any sort of um, mental illness or even sociopathologies in animals? And I think if we all were to get together, you know, all of us over dinner who've ever watched our baboons, we could say, okay, who's the craziest one? And we'd all agree, ah, Achar, she's crazy. But it's very hard, again, to put your finger on it, and, and it would be nothing closely or remotely close to being um, um, autism and be just slightly odd. Um, but it's a good question, and it's one that I think is, is a very interesting one. Um, do chimps and, uh, and um, baboons engage in, in pro-social behavior for the same reasons that we, we do? Have, the whole is, does people know what pro-social behavior is? Shall I explain it? Um, pro-social, or people are nodding, or anyway, um, and you can tell me if you think I'm wrong. I mean, pro-social behavior is loosely described as having consideration for others and cons taking into account the welfare of others. Um, experiments in captivity have suggested that chimpanzees are largely indifferent to outcomes to others. Um, so that, for example, if you give a chimpanzee an opportunity to cooperate, to help another individual obtain food, they're not spiteful. spiteful. They won't take food from others necessarily. Um, they won't prevent that individual from getting food, but they also don't always take the steps to share the food either. Um, um, and this has, this, these sorts of observations have led a lot of people, most notably um, this group at Leipzig um, in Germany, to hypothesize that one of the big differences between humans and other animals is our pro-social tendencies, our tendency to be highly motivated to cooperate with others, to share with others, to engage in joint activities with others. Um, I'm, I'm a bit... Nervous about some of the experiments that have been done in captivity, I guess I would say, because it seems to me that I don't doubt the results. But a lot of the experiments are set up in such a way that, um, you know, you're sliding food trays back and forth so that one chimp can get a food and the other chimp doesn't. Um, but it seems to me that some of the work that's coming out from the um, field suggests that there may that chimpanzees actually do engage in high levels of cooperation, for example, um, and indeed will share food with others on occasion, for example, uh, at some cost to themselves. So I think at this point there's quite a disconnect between the results that people are finding in captivity and the results that appear to be emerging from the field studies. I would somewhat agree because I'm reminded of something I saw on a Yahoo page about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. There's pictures of chimpanzees with dogs, carrying dogs away from the flooding in Japan. Really? 
There are other situations that have been reported where chi a child has fallen into uh, at a zoo, mm -hmm. an area where there has been, I think it was a gorilla. Yeah, we've and been the to the gorilla. cares yeah. for the child. Yeah. So the anecdote was, um, and it's not an anecdote, I mean, it happened, so, I mean, is that um, a child fell into the zoo, uh, the, the gorilla enclosure, and this female Binto picked up the child and carried it to the enclosure's door where the keeper could could get the child. And it, 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 it doubtless, I mean, it undoubtedly happened. The, the, the complication there is that Binto had been um, heavily trained by humans to take care of dolls because they were trying to get her. She'd been reared by humans and chimpanzees and gorillas and other apes that have been reared by humans tend to reject their infants. So um, a lot of animal caretakers now with these human-raised animals have been trying to do these sort of operant tests where they sort of shape the animal's behavior and make them carry and, and reinforce them for carrying and ca taking care of babies. Um, in, in the hopes that they will eventually then be motivated to take care of their own babies. Um, and in the case of Binto, this is what she had experienced. And now that doesn't negate the possibility that she felt genuine compassion. It's just that it's complicated. Right. Right. Um, there's been some evidence of theory of, of a mental theory of mind in corvids and ravens and jays. Right. Uh, would you care to comment on that and on any differences between the corvids and the um, monkeys uh, here? There's some fascinating work uh, being done with corvids and jays, and, and these are species that hide food and cache food. And, and there's been a number of very good experiments that I think are very robust where you can show that if a, if a raven, for example, is caching food and hiding food and is being observed by another raven, um, subsequently he will then rehide the food, whereas if he's not being observed, he doesn't. And there's been some wonderful experiments um, so, suggesting that the animals are acutely sensitive to whether they're being observed. And I think that what's probably going on um, with these animals is that they are very um, aware not only of who's present, but perhaps also aware of who's looking at them. Um, and I think that is, um, a number of experiments have suggested that that's true also of monkeys and, and of chimps. So a class, and one experiment that's been done on, on, on monkeys, for example, which is very simple, um, again with humans, but it's, it's still interesting, is that if you give a monkey the opportunity to steal food from a human who's looking at the food or a human whose face is averted, the monkeys invariably go to the individual whose face is averted, and you can do various controls. So, so I think, again, this gets back to this idea that these rudimentary mental states, the ability to recognize at some level um, that eye gaze direction and gestures can be informative, is probably something that many animals do. Similar experiments have been done with dogs, and dogs are very good at following human gaze and pointing, as many of you know who have dogs. So at that level, I think that people would agree that monkeys and dogs and corvids are quite sensitive to the intentional states of others. It's the knowledge states of others that I think is a little bit more problematical. Yeah. In terms of uh, differentiating genetically derived knowledge from socially derived knowledge or culturally derived knowledge, do you, uh, how do you control in your methodologies and in your studies between those two dimensions? We don't, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult because, for, first of all, we're working with small numbers of animals, and to do the sorts of analyses where you would tease out the genetic and the environmental component would be very difficult. Um, there's a huge amount of interest um, in the last couple of years in, in personality differences and in the genetics of personality. Um, and a huge amount of money is being devoted to that. So, you know, people go do their, you know, research follows the money. So I imagine that there will be a lot of work coming out um, soon. And a, a lot of these efforts are being directed at rhesus macaques, um, in particular on this population that is, for historical, bizarre historical reasons, lives on an island off the coast of Puerto Rico. But they have a big sample size. They can draw blood from the animals, and they can do some very interesting studies. So th those sorts of work is beginning to be done, doing, being done, sorry. And, um, and so that's going to be really interesting. But with the sample size that we're dealing with, I can't pretend. We couldn't pretend to do that. 
Um, this is a question referring back to a couple of the graphs that were up earlier. Um, both the percent infant survival as well as the um, the survival of the actual parents seem to have, it, it showed that the, the strongest relationships um, had the best percentages, but at some point in both graphs, it seemed like the intermediate relationships kind of uh, surpassed those. Yeah, the, the intermediate relationships surpassed those of the stronger relationships. Is it, is it just because the monkeys get old and die, or does that strong relationship actually become like detrimental? Well, it, you know, we don't, I can't answer that question, but the main, the main point here is that our sample size gets really small here. Um, because we're following animals up to about, this age 10 is about the year that the age when males migrate from the group and um, animals die. So by the time you get up to this, at this end, you know, it, the sample sizes get a little bit squirrely. You know, so I would be happy sort of following up here. That's where the sample size is good. But I can, it might well be that being intermediate is somehow good too. We just don't know. Um, but that's, I think, the reason why you see that. Is longevity affected for um, males who bond? Males? Well, you know, it's really interesting because obviously we're studying females here, and, and the males leave the groups in which they were from, which, and, and so they're harder to follow. But um, there's some very interesting data coming out now from some of the species in which males form close social bonds, like dolphins and chimpanzees. And the dolphin data is actually pretty good, suggesting that, that animals who have close bonds um, have higher reproductive success. I don't know about longevity, but have higher reproductive success. Um, and there's some very nice um, data emerging in recent years also, with even with males that leave the group. And baboon males are very aggressive toward one another and don't maintain close bonds. But there are some monkey species in which males, despite being unrelated to one another and despite competing for dominance rank, nonetheless form alliances. And there's been some very interesting um, studies done on macaque monkeys suggesting that males who, form, have, who have a close bond um, and form alliances are able to rise in rank and achieve high reproductive success. So I think what's becoming really, really interesting, and this is data that have only just emerged in the last two years, really, is that we're now seeing from species as diverse as dolphins to mice that what seems to be a major component of some element of reproductive success is close social bonds with members of your own sex. And that's something that people had not predicted um, or had not really looked at, but it really seems to be um, a pretty robust phenomenon across a wide variety of species. I think it's really interesting. But. Um, I thought the, uh, it was very interesting the, the, uh, when you were talking about the um, chimps not um, helping, not teaching the young mm -hmm. to open the nuts. I was just wondering if you're aware of other species in which they, the, the mothers actually do some yeah. training. So teaching is a really odd um, and, and difficult and intriguing phenomenon. I mean, in the case of the chimpanzees, the mothers are certainly very tolerant of their offspring, and they'll often give them the nuts and they'll often even give them tools, but they just don't actively show them. But anybody who's ever had a cat who um, has kittens and brings in half-dead mice and places them under your bed, you know that, that this form of teaching does occur. And there's been some really interesting studies done with meerkats um, showing that um, help meerkats are one of these species in which um, there's only one breeding female and everybody else helps. As anybody who watches Meerkat Manor and knows this, right? And, um, and what you find there is that um, they, 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 the, the animals feed a lot on scorpions, which of course you don't want to mess around with. Um, and so the helpers will bring scorpions to babies to eat once the babies are weaned. And ba when the babies are very small, they'll, um, the helpers will will bite or damage the tail of the scorpion or bite it off so that the scorpion has no tail. And then they'll bring this alive scorpion to the, to the baby and let it mess with around and play with it until, until it kills it. If the babies, once the babies are not babies anymore, young juveniles, get, as they get older, the helpers bring less handicapped scorpions to the babies so that by the time they're sort of almost adult, they're just bringing the scorpion to the child and letting it try to figure out how to get the tail off itself. That looks like a lot like teaching. But when you do playback experiments, so you have a group of meerkat pups who are very, very young, and you do a playback experiment where you play to the helpers the calls of older pups 
The helpers come and they bring intact scorpions to the babies, which is obviously not good. If you have, o- if you have older pups and you play the calls of young pups to the helpers, they bring damaged scorpions to the older pups. So it seems to be, functionally, of course, it's teaching. Functionally, from an adaptive perspective, but from the mechanisms underlying it, it looks a lot different from what humans would do. They don't, you know, it seems to be sort of triggered by the call they hear, rather than any assessment about ability or ignorance or knowledge. Uh, thank you for the great presentations, and I'm amazed about the uh, findings and uh, monkeys' capability for planning, actually. And in regard to those results, uh, especially in regard to the results of increasing of uh, cortisol and testosterone uh, before patrolling, uh, can we be uh, can we be uh, sure that those increase increases not uh, a result of uh, perceiving some signs from the surrounding and conditioned reaction, response, conditioned like, response? Um, like a scent or an odor or something? Like a, a, condition, a conditioning reaction. Oh, a conditioned response. Yes. Um, no, we can't be sure of anything. I mean, you know, because we, we can't interview the animals in, in, in a sense and ask them. I think um, the thing is that, that um, the stress response in, in animals seems to be highly... Um, sensitive to events that impact, uh, that affect these individuals. And, and so it's a generalized response. And, um, and, and, and what is stressful to one animal may not be stressful to another. So for example, and so, so in that sense, I think if it is a conditioned response, it's going to be much, it's going to be sensitive to the perturbations of what's going on in the group as a whole and whether it affects me and whether it, um, and how, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to think of an example and I can't. But but for exa- but here's an example that doesn't actually address your question entirely. But when you look at something like a, a predation event, the group is moving as a unit and everybody sees this predation event. You know you you know and we know from sorry experience that yeah this is a really scary event. I mean these lions come swooping in and there's chaos and then suddenly the seven monkeys are gone, and so this is a stressful event. So everybody is. Uh, witnesses this event, and everybody um, in su- to some degree participates in it. But it's only the indiv- not only, but it's primarily the individuals who actually lose a close relative who experience this increase in, in glucocorticoids. So in that sense, it seems to be specific to the relationship that um, pertains among individuals rather than the event itself. So in that sense, I think it's a little bit more um, sensitive than simply a conditioned response. Is that? I'm cu- curious about this establishment of a companionship outside family or perhaps outside social group. Uh, do, you, do you see behavioral correlates that uh, would lead you to anticipate uh, how this comes about? Or do you perhaps believe in pheromones, uh, pheromonal well, uh, you know, association um, amongst these animals? The nice thing about studying primates um, is that they have more or less the same sort of um, sensory perceptions as we do. Their olfactory systems may be a little bit better, but basically they see and hear and smell more or less what we see and hear and smell. So it's a lot easier to study primates than, for example, a dog for whom the world is a big smell and, 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 a very, and, and an incredibly informative smell. And, and so we could never, I think, that makes monkeys, just studying monkeys a lot easier because we can suggest that, that in a sense, um, we can to largely rule out, not entirely, that, that there's, there are a lot of sort of sensory modalities that we're missing. And so um, in terms of the relationships uh, that we see, it's very hard, of course, to understand what motivates the formation of a bond. Um, you can only describe the... Um, this, the sort of sequence of behaviors that you see that develop it. And, and in, in primates, it's primarily grooming. Um, and, and the animals groom at much higher rates than they need to in order to remove ectoparasites. And it seems people have shown that, that grooming, and especially being groomed, is a, is a very, um, a very um, pleasurable thing. But you could also see from the oxytocin in these chimps that not all grooming bouts are equal. And that if you're being groomed or grooming with somebody with whom you have a kind of um, 
I won't, won't want to say testy relationship, but perhaps not a, a sort of uncertain one. It's not that um, relaxing, whereas grooming with a, with a close friend is. And I think intuitively we know that. You know, you go out to dinner with someone you don't know very well, it's never as relaxing as if you have dinner with your best friend. And, and I, I sort of think about that as an analogy that, that these animals are perhaps experiencing as well. And that's why I think these hormones are interesting because it does allow you to say, to see that from their perspective, the animal's perspective, not all behaviors that look identical to us are identical to them. And that's nice. Well, uh, on the other hand, it must be very difficult to tell the difference between causal and effect. Absolutely. Uh, we have these correlates. These correlates are correlates. And we have no idea about the cause and effect. And so as a result, we just say these things are correlated with each other. But I, would, I think we have, can say in terms of predation events that the predation event probably causes the increase in cortisol. But in terms of grooming, no, I wouldn't. I was going to ask one more about the effect of... Uh, of these gang, uh, gang ups on uh, uh, outside of the group people and the relationship to flash mob yes. in current society. Well, I can ask, ask him if he would be happy to talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, the longevity data. So, you know, you would expect. What, sorry, the what data? The, 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 the data with the weak, weak ties and strong ties. Mm -hmm. And so you might expect that. Um, it's always about a 15, 20% difference between the strongest. Uh, ties between and the weakest ties in terms of mortality here. And would you expect that? I mean, you say it suggests that there's it is, it is an adaptive nature to it, but um, you, if you come back 20 years from now, there will always be weakly uh, linked individuals. Come back 50 years from now, there will always be weakly linked because there's various um, causes for it, parent, yeah. parental differences, some genetic differences. So... Do you think there will always be individuals who are not strongly bonded to other females, but they're in the group until they die? And um, That's a very good question. I mean, um, I, I, I think that one of the great mysteries of, of this correlation that people are now seeing in so many different species, including humans, between um, close social bonds and some measure of health, one of the great um, mysteries is that I don't think anyone really knows the mechanisms. You can't relate it entirely to stress. And if you read those books about longevity and so on and for humans, I don't think um, any particular hypothesis is advanced about what the mechanisms are. And so I think it's really interesting that this, this, this data set is emerging, but we, I don't think people have a very clear idea. I mean, and I think this is perhaps one of the factors that's motivating these studies in personality um, that people are beginning to conduct. But, um, you know, but the problem with, you know, genetics of personality is we all know that there's so many environmental and complicated interactions between genes and environment and epigenetic effects and so on that you can't just sort of say, I'm going to go study the genetics of personality or these animals or this family, which now manifests such strong bonds, is always going to be a strong bonded family where everybody lives long. We know that. You know, in, you know, anecdotally from our own relationships that things change and perturbations come in. And so we just have this data set, I mean, this, this evidence from lots of species, but I don't think anyone understands the mechanism. That doesn't answer your question, but anyway. Well, this is a follow-up, I think, of the same question. So with regard to the same data, um, is there, are there specific behaviors of any type, such as providing food, um, nursing back to health from a diseased or a sick infant, or protection pred from predation that would lead you to conclude there is, is improved offspring survival, or do you just simply measure survival without having a real understanding of why it occurs? Short answer is the latter. I mean, we, you know, the thing about primates, um, in, in, in contrast to some other species of animals, is that you don't see any joint nursing or suckling. You don't see food provisioning the way you would say in cooperatively hunting dogs or, 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 or what meerkats for that matter. So you don't, and I mean, animals will maybe, like chimps will maybe share meat, but they're not going to provision a sick animal. And you don't see active caring for, uh, like, you know, if you have a, um, a sick adult, animals are not going to be bringing it food. So, so in that sense, it's very different from the sort of compassion that, that people display where we seem to recognize when other individuals are incapacitated in some way. So the first question we would have to answer is, 
Are, can animals recognize when another individual is incapacitated? We don't know the answer to that. And secondly, if they are, if they could, this, this is where the pro-sociality question comes in. Would they be motivated to do so? All we know is that they don't really do so. And so this is, as I say, a big black box. We don't know why these results are the way they are, and I don't think anyone does. We just know that they're increasingly evident in, in a variety of different animals. So, again, I don't know. I was, uh, I was wondering um, how you knew when to collect the pre-hunt hormone levels. Um, basically, how did you know that they were about to go on a hunt? Or did you guys keep constant hormone levels with you? Or? Well, I mean, these we didn't. We should give the, you know, the people who gathered these data. Um, um, this Marissa Subolowski, what she did, and what other people have done, Roman Rittig and Kathy Crawford as well, is that you can't tell when someone is going to pee, you know, sort of. and so you have to run around with these plastic bags. They're basically large frisbees, and catch catch this urine, and then you have to what they what they the way they do it is they follow these animals assiduously, and they note as much as they can, with as much certitude as they can, who these animals interacted with, what was the nature of their interaction, what else was going on in the group, was there a border patrol, were there alarm calls, was food being shared. And so then you, have the, you get the urine, and so then you can backtrack events for three hours, and then you can also look at what happened in the subsequent three hours. And all you do then is, again, it's correlations. It's not, you know, you can't, you can't sort of show that one, you know, cause the other. But you can then show that after a hunt, because the cortisol in urine is reflecting events that occurred in the last one to three hours. So, so you can say after a hunt, um, after me, you know, there was, we, we follow this male, um, you followed him for three hours, and he, you know, he caught this monkey, and he then, um, you know, then he, he, um, he peed, or he shared the food, and then you caught his urine, and you can sort of say that you saw this upsurge in cortisol. But you, it depends on you having also gotten cortisol samples from all those periods of times when there wasn't a hunt, or there wasn't grooming, or there wasn't um, a, a border patrol. So it's a complicated analysis. Um, and, of course, you can never rule out 100% that you didn't see some other interaction. But I think these people have been pretty careful about trying to do that. Because if you don't do that, you just mess up your own data. You know, so you really don't want to, to, do, um, to be uncertain about what transpired within in those hours. A question that relates to the uh, earlier theory of mind discussion, I guess. So, um, I mean, the first part of it is sort of a basic level question. What, what behaviors do you observe that, that allows you to document or operationalize who is higher up in the hierarchy? Um, how does that manifest itself? I mean, in terms the dominance of hierarchy? Dominance hierarchy. How and do then, we – oh, so, so the, the way we um, determine who, who ranks what is simply by what most what people call approach, retreat, interactions. I walk up to Robert and Robert retreats, and that means I'm dominant. Um, and then we can, and, and that happens all the time, and, in the, and, and because it's 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 just ubiquitous. Um, and the, so these are not threats; these are not um, aggressive interactions. And often the animals will remain near each other. It's just somebody gives way. So does that, or anything else that comes along with being higher in the in the you know pecking order, um, display anything related to theory of mind in the sense that it's you know deference to the intentions of somebody who's higher in the hierarchy than you are? I don't think so, not necessarily. It could be, but, but I don't think we would um, take the fact that, um, you know, Robert defers to me as a sign that he understands that I think that I'm dominant or something like that. Um, and you could easily learn this through simple associative conditioning, you know, um, if he doesn't give way, I beat him up. So, you know, <laughs> something like that. But, I mean, but the problem is this is the problem. This is one reason why theory of mind studies are so very difficult, simply because you can always explain behavior in either the most full-blown theory of mind way or with a simple explanation. And, and this is one reason, I think, why people have done many of these tests in captivity where they hope to control for as many of these alternative explanations as possible. Um, I think other of our experiments and many other people's experiments would certainly lend support to the idea that the hypothesis that animals recognize um, intentions and motivations, motives in others. Um, but the, where the debate is is whether or not animals recognize knowledge states in others. That you have a, you know, that, that I would need to inform you about something that you didn't already know. 
And there have been attempts in captivity, in, in captive studies to, to ask that question um, with chimps with sort of mixed results. Um, you know, I think the, the, the question is still open. You know, I, I wouldn't want to, I, I think most people would, believe, would, would probably agree that at this point, the false belief task that children pass at about the age of four is, is um, beyond the capacity of animals. But you never know when somebody might come along and show that that was wrong. But I, I think that's what, what people would say. Well, we 